Well, welcome everybody, and thank you for having me here. I guess you know I'm I'm Guy Newland. I'm doing the uh, workshop seminar this weekend, and um, I'm I'm happy to be back here. I was here last two years ago, apparently, and um, it's a very comfortable place, very welcoming group of people. So thank you for having me back. Um, <clears throat> this morning, I wanted to talk about love, compassion, a little bit. Um, and uh, particularly different techniques that are suggested in the Buddhist tradition for dealing with obstacles that come up when we're trying to cultivate love and compassion. And um, I want to do that from the point of view of trying to consider um, how these ideas are um, common to different parts of the Buddhist tradition and are not necessarily the private property of one particular sect or school of philosophy within Buddhism and are not private property of Mahayana Buddhism and in a sense in many ways are not private property of Buddhism at all but are really about um, our common humanity. Um, so first I, I start with a, a couple of passages from scriptures, Sutra and Shastra. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none, through anger or ill will, wish to harm another. Even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart cherish all living beings radiating kindness over the entire world. So, uh, yeah, that's not Shantideva, that is um, the Pali Canon, that's a sutta, that's the word of Buddha from um, the Karaniya Metta Sutta, which you can look up on the internet, Metta Sutta. Um, and then, you know, just a, a passage from Nagarjuna, we were talking a lot about Nagarjuna yesterday, and his being so famous for his articulation of um, profound ideas about emptiness of inherent existence, um, explaining these things in a very clear, um, what do you say, f uh, extensive way to make, make clear that the idea of dependent arising implies the idea that there's no graspable essence in things at all. Um, but that wasn't all that Nagarjuna was about. Um, he, he was also focused on the compassion side of the path as well. And um, so you may have heard of the text, The Precious Garland, <clears throat> which it, it seems is a, a text where uh, Nagarjuna was probably actually, um, uh, I say, giving advice or <laughs> writing an, uh, uh, an appeal um, to a king. Now, we don't know exactly which king, exactly when, but it seems that this was really the case. If you read the whole the text closely, and it's, there are multiple translations of it, there are parts of it which read a little bit like a grant application. You know, please, <laughs> it would be so great for you if you were to donate this money for a Dharma center and so forth. But um, yeah, it's full of, you know, advice about um, emptiness and the importance of taking the Mahayana path seriously. Um, but also all kinds of practical advice on how to implement policy as a leader of a state, you know, in a way that's consistent with compassion. So there's like a whole section on prison reform, basically, right in this text by Nagarjuna, um, which I'm not going to read. But I'll read another little passage, which I don't know, a little bit comes to mind thinking of some of the things that are going on with our public policy now. Always care compassionately for the sick the unprotected, those stricken with suffering, the lowly, the poor, and take special care to nourish them. Provide extensive care for the persecuted, for the victims of crop failure, the stricken, the victims of contagion, for those in conquered areas, and provide stricken farmers with sustenance and seed. I was just reading this morning that in addition to um, <clears throat> gang violence, you know, one of the reasons so many people are coming out of uh, Honduras and El Salvador 
is crop failure because of global warming has like ruined the agricultural conditions in some of these countries. Yeah. So, yeah, yay Buddhist texts. I mean, this is a thing that I was like um, trying to talk about a little bit yesterday that when people have asked His Holiness the Dalai Lama, you know, for advice about, well, what should we do for our practice? Um, he said, well, you should get up in the morning and read a little bit of a Buddhist text in translation because there's so many good translations. And he said, if you just like get up and read one page or one verse or something out of a good translation of a Buddhist sutra or a Buddhist shastra, um, and then just sit and reflect and meditate on and think about, you know, what you're getting out of it and whether, how it feels to you and how it might apply to your life. That's a practice, and then you can do the same thing the next day. And then, and then you're taking these, these texts which come to us through the tradition to heart. I, uh, I mean, I think, you know, I, as a Buddhist, that that's what authenticity means. There's this whole question about what, is, what does authenticity mean as the Dharma spreads to different countries and then is changed, you know? Do we actually have to all uh, like to eat... Um, butter tea and momos and other to be Buddhist? I mean, obviously not, right? That, maybe we like that, but that's not one of the <laughs> stipulations. So we're not going to become Tibetans, right? So, um, you know, where, what is, what constitutes our authenticity as Buddhist practitioners? Um, because what we do as Buddhists here in the United States is never going to be exactly what anybody ever did in traditional Tibet. Right? And I think it has to do with taking what we receive from the tradition seriously into our own minds. And these texts are, as this is what this is holding as a point, if you go back 60 or 70 years, these texts really were very little available. You had the poly, you had the early poly text society and so forth, and there were a few other things. But now we have so many really good texts, and most of them now in multiple translations where you, you don't, you can compare how different people, you know, who knew the languages are bringing out different nuances in, in, the, uh, in the original. Um, you can learn a lot then without having to study the language about what's authentically received by us, you know, as American Buddhists. And um, w when we do that, if we do that, um, I think it's, uh, it's important not to um, be too, uh, what shall we say, um, you know, partisan and thinking that, well, since we're, we're tantric practitioners, we're only going to read a certain kind of text, or since we're, you know, we want to be in the Bodhisattva path, we're not going to read the Pali Canon. Um, th these, are, these are all word of Buddha texts. If you, if you listen to what His Holiness has said about the three turnings of the wheel, um, you know, that he's saying that all of the texts in the Buddhist Canon have things to teach that, that we can benefit from. Right? And that it's not like, oh, certain classes of practitioners should only read these texts and don't want to contaminate their mind. This is all the word of Buddha. We don't want to like, imagine ourselves as being too good for any part of it. And so really what I wanted to try to do to say, like, okay, we know that, for example, Shanti Deva um, is famous within the Mahayana tradition for his articulation of ideas about love and compassion. But just exactly how different are these ideas from other ideas that were in non-Mahayana Buddhism 300 years earlier, for example, right? Um, so I'm not saying they're exactly the same, but I think you'll, you'll see from what I, what I have to say this morning that they're more the same than they're different. And the reason is because they're all authentically Buddhist. <laughs> they're all deriving from the same, they're all part of the same tradition. It's not because Shantideva was cribbing off some earlier non-Mahayana guy or something like that. It's just they're, they're all deriving from the word of the Buddha. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the two people I wanted to sort of compare in terms of what they say about cultivating love and overcoming obstacles that come up in that process are Shantideva and uh, Buddha Gosa. So Shantideva has lived in the 8th century and he's like a very famous uh, Mahayana scholar. Um, 
particularly for the text Bodhisattva Charya Avatara, which like entering into the, the Bodhisattva career or entering into the Bodhisattva path, entering into the Bodhisattva way of life is one of the translations. That's kind of nice, right? Um, yeah. And, um, and this text um, is uh, sort of addressed to himself. He addresses the text to himself <laughs> and saying, I need to understand and realize this. But of course, by writing all this down, he's, he's, his, um, he's doing, in effect, a, a performance, talking to himself in a public way, whereby we all get the benefit of overhearing how he's coaching himself, right? And then we can choose to benefit from it. And uh, this is exactly what he says in the text. You know, I, I'm, I'm writing this down and thinking this out for, to, so that I can you know, improve my own way of being, but hopefully other people you know, reading this, since I'm writing it all down, will benefit as well. Um, and so that, that's uh, kind of the paradigmatic statement of uh, the bodhisattva uh, dedication, you know, to the welfare of all beings. In some sense then, you know, as uh, Mahayana Buddhists, we might think, and obviously therefore completely superior to anything that non-Mahayana non -Mahayanas would ever come up with, right? And so that's why it's a pretty good test case to think about, compare, well, just in what exact ways is it different? And it is different. But like how different is it as compared to other things people have been saying in non-Mahayana texts, you know, in the centuries before? So our reference point for this is this guy Buddha Gosa. Buddha Gosa was, uh, was fifth century, so roughly 300, 250 years before Shantideva. He was also from India, but he left India and moved to what's now Sri Lanka, right, and became um, a Theravada, proto-Theravada practitioner um, there, and a great scholar and author of many, many commentaries on um, the Pali Canon, you know, on, on Theravada Buddhist texts that represent the word of Buddha. Um, so they both, Buddha Gosa and Shantideva, recommend that we should cultivate loving care, which is I'm, what or we could say, we usually say compassion toward um, all living beings and without exception. And uh, that in the process, <clears throat> we will have to deal with overcoming grudges <laughs> and resentments and hostilities. That is, some of these beings are going to be harder for us to include in our sphere of loving care than others. Um, so then they provide a kind of um, medicine cabinet, or what do you say, a range of uh, uh, potential devices, techniques, remedies that you know, a meditator can choose to deploy these techniques or use these remedies in, in, deal, in, in their own meditation. And if you, you try something and, and it doesn't work, you don't say, oh gosh, this Buddhism thing isn't working for me and I love everybody except for that person. Um, then there's something else you can try. And they, all, they both, both say essentially that. Um, yeah. So, um, you could say that these, some of these techniques, and this has been argued about a lot in the case of Shantideva in particular, some of these techniques might not be philosophically compatible with each other. In other words, um, it, their, their goal, both of them, is not to sort of put forth a philosophically philosophically coherent system or worldview where all of this exactly fits together. They're fine with uh, indirectly contradicting themselves if saying, you know, move over a little to the left here and move over a little to the right is a contradiction. Well, of course, I mean, you say those different things to different people at different times, right? You give, a good doctor doesn't give everybody the same medicine. Um, you know, a coherent medical practice that's attuned and responsive gives, you know, uh, anti-constipation medicine to some people and anti-diarrhea medicine to different people. And it doesn't, you know, and, and the, those have contradictory effects, right? So these, the, the, the teachings that they're giving, the words that they're saying, 
are, are remedies that you have to, you have to understand, like this is the basic metaphor, or one of the core metaphors in the tradition that the Buddha is not like a Lord, God, judge, creator, but like a supreme physician. That's the idea. And so, yeah, phys- clinical practice, right? You're trying to figure out like what would actually help this person at this particular time, you know? Mm. Um, so, first of all, um, how to cultivate, so love, care, compassion. I mean, in like general, love is a wish for the happiness and well-being of, of other beings. And, you know, universal love means including everyone in that. What we usually call compassion um, is wishing for others to be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. Um, so I mean, I try, I'm trying to use the word care a lot, or loving care, um, sometimes instead of saying compassion, um, because um, compassion is etymologically, and to a certain extent in our connotation in English, is really a feeling, an emotion, and that's not bad, but like how much of it can we feel? Like if I, <laughs> if, if compassion is feeling close to empathy, and empathy means feeling for the pain of another, and now I'm going to feel for the pain of the whole world. Mm, that's going to be required. That's going to be extraordinary, right? Really difficult for me to empathetically respond. This is why, why we talk about compassion fatigue, right? Because there's, so on the other hand, like what they really have in mind here, and that it's not that we shouldn't feel an, an emotional, res- a t- what do you say, mirror neuron empathetic emotional responsiveness to seeing others suffer, that's really important too. But when you're talking about extending this boundlessly, right, what it, it really is is um, a genuine heartfelt wish for the welfare of others. And, and that is... Um, you know, an intention, a forceful intention, an intention that has sincere heart behind it. But it's not exactly the same as, as um, a passion or an emotion, if you see what I mean. It's more a, wi- a will or a wish that something be the case. And, um, and that way it's easier to understand how it can be extended boundlessly. Um, it still might be difficult, right? Because that includes some some people that we have problems with that have to be included in there. But but um, so I don't want I don't want to imply that that um, there's no emotional dimension to to love and compassion. There is, but if you look in the tradition as these things are understood, it's mainly a sort of a, a thought in a sense, an intention, a wish that others be well, that they be free from suffering. Um, so what, how do we go about like cultivating these things? And Shantideva, for example, um, basically says, since everyone experiences suffering, that I should protect everyone just as I do myself. So he starts out for the assumption, from the example, that we're going to want to protect ourselves from suffering. And then he's saying, well, why, if suffering is a problem for you, then why would it not also be a problem for you that other people have it? And he uses this example that, like, um, you know, if my, if my right hand is really hurting, why is that a problem for any other part of my body? <laughs> Right, is so so right. He's saying like, you know, yeah, that's the right hand can deal with that. You know, like let it worry about it, take care of its own problems. Right. He's saying no. You know, we're just all the parts of the body are not because they want good karma, <laughs> but just spontaneously, you know, act in a way that um, seems to be caring towards the other parts of the body where there's, you know. Uh, unpleasant sensations, <laughs> just like oh, okay, my shoulder feels better now. Oh, good job. <laughs> no, right? You just spontaneously take care of the different parts of the body, and saying that's how it is, you know, with people as well. I should um, 
sees suffering, wherever it is, as something to be eliminated, just because it's suffering. What's, what, is, what is special about me that only my suffering is worth my care? It's very difficult to justify, you know, what exactly that is. Um, yeah. So, it's, in other words, it's, our normal way of behaving in that regard is transparently irrational. <laughs> we can't justify it to any objective third party judge about like why it's so important for me to only worry about myself, right? And say, well, all these other people have all these problems. Yes, your honor, but I have this problem. It really hurts. And it's like, oh, well, in that case, yeah, you're more important than all these other beings, right? And as you know that that's not going to work. It doesn't make any sense. It's just the way we're conditioned to behave, right? Um, right. So, yeah, you take yourself as an example. This is how pain feels. This is why it's to be eliminated. It's not really different with other people as it is with myself. And Buddhaghosa says, right, not Mahayana, the same thing. Just as I want to be happy and dread pain, so do other beings, taking oneself as an example. I mean, this is almost like coming out of the Dalai Lama's mouth, right? But it's from a Theravada text, right? Take yourself as an example and think, oh, that's just how it is for others. The pain hurts, right? So this general idea of taking oneself as an example in terms of understanding, you know, the reality, the actuality of other people's suffering is common um, among Buddhists and it's common beyond the Buddhist world. Um, truly caring for ourselves and knowing, you know, that we would wish ourselves to be well, when we understand that and interrogate what that really means, you know, engages us in caring for other people because insofar as you understand that they're just equally as vulnerable as we are. There are, you know, brothers and sisters in this big pain family, like all the parts of my body are, you know, you know integrated in that way. And this is the same thing that, you know, is in the... Um, um, in the Gospels, uh, the Gospel of Mark says essentially the same thing, um, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Confucius says the same thing. He says, um, if you want to know how to treat others, take yourself as an example. That's in the Analects of Confucius. That was like a little bit before the time of Buddha. There wasn't any email or anything, so they couldn't <laughs> didn't influence each other, right? It's a long way. Right? Yeah, people just came up with this idea, very, very similar, because they are human beings who were thinking about what does it mean to be a human being and how should we as human beings treat other human beings. Right? Hmm. Um, so suffering is suffering. And if you think, maybe you're okay with that. So, yeah, suffering is, it, you know, has its, it's not always necessarily the worst thing. But if you're interested in eliminating or mitigating or minimizing suffering, then it becomes hard to justify why we should only be concerned about our, ours, what makes our suffering particularly special. In fact, what does it even mean to say this suffering is mine? <laughs> I have my private suffering and, you know, it's none of your business. It's very difficult to say that it's my suffering and your suffering is different. We have to understand exactly what it means to be me. <laughs> and that takes us into this whole question of is there a really findable private self that can, can own this suffering? Yeah. Mencius, who is Confucius's follower, said, well... You know, if someone's just going along, a regular person's going along the side of the road and they see a child sitting on the edge of a well about to fall in, a sense of alarm will come up in them. All right, because maybe there's exceptions, right? But for a lot of people, it means there's a child about to fall in. You don't say, hmm, whose child is that? Are they here legally? You know, <laughs> do you say that? No, you're like, ah, oh, ah. Oh. Now maybe you're like, oh. you're, maybe some people go, oh, there's a child, oh, yeah, but maybe, yeah, and then they don't do anything, right? He's not saying everybody does something to help, but, like, there's, a, like, a very quick moment where everybody has this sort of natural sense of alarm at the child sitting on the edge of the well about to fall in, right? They say, yeah, that's what we, the, every, everybody's got something like that, we have that as a start, common starting point. There's a movie I, I like called The Girl in the Cafe, which is about extreme poverty, and in it, there's this uh, character, the girl, right? Turns out that she's been in prison, and this guy that 
this diplomat that she's been hanging around with says, oh, you know, I didn't know you were in prison. What were you in prison for? And she said, oh, I hurt a man. And she said, why did, why did, he says, why did you do that? And he said, well, because he hurt a child. And he says, was it your child? Whose child was it? And she says, does it matter? <laughs> What does that even mean, right? Oh, I only have certain children. These are the children that I care about. All these little children go to hell, right? That doesn't make any very much sense. All right. So, um, yeah, a difference is that Shanti Deva, and this is very famous, and you know, in the in Bodhisattva texts, um, really revels in imagines in imagining situations where he. Um, is used and abused. That's probably, they're both used and abused by other beings for the sake of their benefit. Um, for example, he says, for the sake of others, I've made this body pleasureless. Let them beat it, play with it, ridicule it, and cover it with filth. If any of my suffering alleviates any of theirs, then of course a compassionate person will want to induce that. In other words, he, he think the Bodhisattva's compassion entails the idea of willingly undergoing for oneself at, as much suffering as is possibly necessary to bring any sort of happiness to other beings, okay? Um, and it, yeah, there's quite a lot about that in Shantideva and also in, you know, Nagarjuna, the er earlier, earlier Mahayana, uh, in, in the Precious Garland that I was reading earlier, Nagarjuna says, may I always be an object of enjoyment for all living beings in whatever way accords with their wishes and without any interference, just that as it is with the earth, the water, the fire, the wind, the herbs, and the wild forests. In other words, my body and my mind are resources that I place 100% at the disposal of other living beings, right? With, and they can use them in whatever way that I, I make myself a slave of, of, the, of the living beings that I'm trying to serve. And this is kind of, you know, you could say like this idea that I'm, so, I'm utterly dedicated to helping these other living beings and there's so many of them and they're like my mothers and I'm going to put their interests ahead of mine, right? And I'll find my ultimate happiness in enduring some suffering on their behalf, right? Um, so, yeah, yesterday I talked about that my idea is the basic idea of Buddhism is that we suffer needlessly because we don't see things as they are. And then I interrogated this question of, well, what is needless suffering? In this case, the Bodhisattva is saying very clearly, well, as a, you know, someone dedicated to the welfare of all living beings, sometimes it's, it's, it's good to undergo suffering, right? Because it's for the greater welfare of, of all of these other living beings. And insofar as that's true, in the long run, it's also for, for my good as well. And a lot of examples of that. Buddhaghosa does not agree with this. I mean, he was 300 years before, so he didn't specifically criticize it directly. But his idea of you know, loving kindness is extending all this love equally in all directions, equally. And that means for him that um, you, you can't be wishing ill even for yourself. So, um, yeah, that... You know, there's this idea if that you have love for uh, all living beings, taking yourself as an example, you have to begin with actually caring in, for yourself. And you, you just know from doing these practices that, you know, you have to start with meditating on a, a sense of care and well-being, wishing well for oneself, and then extend that out. And some people get stuck on that first step because they don't really love themselves, right? And Buddhaghosa is really emphatic on that point. You know, he said it. If a bandit comes along and there, there's four of you, you and your worst enemy and some stranger you don't know and your best friend, and there's a four of you, and the bandit says, okay, I'm going to kill one of you. Which one is it? And then you said, well, kill me. Then you don't have loving kindness. You shouldn't be able to choose. This is, this is what Buddha Gosa says. It's very clear from what Shanti Deva writes. He's, he's got a different idea, right? He's got the Bodhisattva will be saying, yeah, yeah, I'm your, I'm your guy, right? Now, Buddha Gosa thinks, no, that's, that's wishing harm on a living being. It just happens that you are the living being. So in, the, in this regard, they do have a difference, right? I'm not trying to say that they're exactly the same. But this basic idea of the way we extend loving care to others is by... <clears throat> 
taking our own feelings as an example is the commonality between them. I, then they both agree that the major problem in doing this is our resentment or grudges or anger toward other people that we perceive as, as having harmed us, usually in the past. And then they both give a whole bunch of different ideas. How many different ideas depends on how you count. <laughs> I was actually at a conference last year, and we went through all the ones that Budagosa gave, and everybody had a different way of counting. And you know, it's like, is it 19 or is it 16? It depends on how you count. Is that three different ones? And but my point is, it's a lot. They have a lot of different things. It's not just like here's the remedy that Buddha prescribed. There's a whole bunch of different, you know, techniques that are suggested. Okay, one that's in common, for example, is Buddha. At look at the life stories of the Buddha as a moral exemplar. So they both tell stories, Jataka stories, stories from Buddha's past lives, stories from the, the Buddha's the life of Siddhartha, about the Buddha's kindness, right? Even to people who are intending to harm him and so forth. And then these 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 script it's scripture-based inspiration. In other words, this is the way the Buddha lived his life and his lives as a bodhisattva, and we should be inspired to live in accordance with his example. So you say that's a, like a, um, a, that's a, that's a technique, right? Based on faith, confidence in the Buddha, uh, reverence for the Buddha, admiration of the Buddha, Buddha as a role model, you know, think about how the Buddha behaved and try to be more like that, right? That, that's one way to, to, to work with it. Another, the kind of negative side of that is the idea that, um, well, if you don't even try to act the way Buddha would have acted in a situation where there was somebody seeking to do harm, then how can you really say that you're truly a follower of the Buddha? Yeah, so I'm not making this up or pronouncing it on my own behalf. I'm just quoting the text. They say, you know, take the mind to the thought that will I truly be a follower of the Buddha if I hate this or that person and just think that that's okay, right? Um, so both Shantideva and Buddhaghosa say the same thing about that. Um, Buddhaghosa is particularly vivid <laughs> about it. Uh, he tells a story from the Pali Canon where the Buddha said, if there's some bandits grab hold of you and take a two-handed saw and saw off your limbs one at a time, if you should on that account hold hate in your heart against them, you will not be one of my followers. Right? Okay, so that's look, I'm just read I'm just telling you what it says, right? All right. That's a that's that's like that reminds that's one of the hard sayings, right? <laughs> like something something to live up to. Yeah. Shanti Deva is like, he, he, I think Shanti Deva takes into account, oh yeah, okay, that's going to be tough, right, for people to say, oh, there's somebody hungry and I don't have any food, I'll give them a piece of my thigh, right? So, yeah, he says, well, that might not be the best medicine for everybody, right? Maybe not everybody's ready to live up to that. So let's, let's get people used to the idea of being generous a little bit at a time, right? And we'll gradually train our minds in generosity and, 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 and meditating on emptiness and meditating on love and compassion. And maybe there'll be a lifetime in which it won't be any big deal for us to give away parts of our body. You see that guy, the story this week about the school principal who, who died giving a bone marrow donation to a stranger in France? Yeah. Um, so, wanting to emulate the Buddha, not wanting to be failing to emulate the Buddha, and then um, realizing that Holding hate, holding resentment, holding anger in your heart hurts you, okay? So we care about ourselves. <laughs> Consider the fact that if you're holding on to a grudge or a resentment, who is that actually hurting? It's actually hurting you right now for sure and, you know, making you lose sleep, right? Making you feel sick in your stomach, right? and, you know, harming your ability to practice virtue, right? So maybe, you know, maybe some vengeance will come about. <laughs> 
or maybe not. What's for sure is that one person is definitely already harmed, right? And they both say this, and they're, 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 they're quite clear about it. Like Buddhaghosa says, this is pretty close paraphrase, suppose an enemy has hurt you, why try as well to hurt your own mind? With the hurt that anger brings, you are already punished right now, right? And then Buddhaghosa enumerates all the various faults that are associated with anger in various Buddhist texts, and Shantideva does exactly the same thing. Then they both go on to say, in their own ways, that you shouldn't think of this other person as your real enemy. This is like super important. Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, is the first person that I heard say this, but it's like in, in all Buddhist texts in one way or another. Yeah, when you say, you know, foe destroyers or, right, you're talking about like, who, who are these foes that we're supposed to be destroying? Who are these bad guys <laughs> that we want to wipe out? It's all like mental afflictions. It, there's no other, no living beings who properly stand within the class of enemies. That's the idea. All these living beings are, are you know, our family. Our, we're all in the, the family of vulnerability and impermanence <laughs> together. And um, we're all... Um, being harmed by the same kinds of afflictions in different ways at different times. And so we have a common set of enemies, and it's not other living beings, right? So, yeah, take to mind the fact that your real enemy is, like, for example, if that person seems angry at you and disposed to hurt you, it's not the living being who themselves is suffering from the condition of anger or possibly the bad karma they'll get if they do something to hurt you. It's the anger itself, and that anger is something that you, you have the same propensity for and probably are beginning to feel already yourself. So, yeah, you have a common enemy, in other words. Okay, that's a very, that's a very important one. Um, another one is to reflect on the fact that all beings are the owners of their own karma. So you could say, yeah, yeah, their own karma, and so you know they're going to they're going to get what they have coming. It's none of our business, <laughs> you know, what kinds of suffering other people. So it's not like that at all. What they do with this, all beings are the owners of their own karma, is to say that our a couple of things. One is that our presence as you know, victims of harm is in, you know, most Buddhist explanations, um, um, it's the main cause of our suffering is that we're there as, as victims of harm from somebody else. So in other words, something that we did in the past is coming to fruition and our being in a situation of being suffering at that other person's hands. Do you see what I'm saying? So we, we created the, the karma. We, we're the owner of the karma that created a situation where we're being harmed by that other person. So that's a reflection that both, both of these people invite. And then, um, and then Buddhaghosa goes on to say, look, you know, when, they're, when they're doing something to hurt you because you're there as a result of your karma and they do something to hurt you, they're the ones who are going to go to hell for that. And so we should have compassion for these people who are harming us because of the suffering that they'll undergo in the future as a result of the harm they're doing now. I've actually heard the Dalai Lama say this, you know, when he started asking about the Chinese uh, human rights abuses in Tibet and how he says, oh, I get a little flash of anger and it very quickly turns to compassion. And I don't think he means compassion for the victims. He's talking about compassion for the people who are, the, for the Chinese, right? Yeah. And Shanti David goes even farther with this karma thing. He says, our presence as a victim is actually a, a condition that's necessary for these other people to do harm that will lead to their future suffering. Do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> if we were here for them to harm, then they wouldn't you know, be doing these harmful things. So we're actually one of the conditions for them to go to hell. And so in that sense, we're conditioned for them being harmed. As they're harming us, he invites us to reflect on how we're actually harming them by being here as, as their victim. Um, and not only that, but because their aggression against us gives this great, uh, this great opportunity to cultivate patience and forbearance and compassion, 
we're really in their debt because we will never become Buddhas without strengthening our patience and compassion, especially for the people who are being hard on us, right? It's not just like, oh, yeah, I can be compassionate for puppies. No, you know, right? <laughs> That's a low level, yeah. So, um, yeah, we have to strengthen our ability to extend loving care. And who's giving us a chance? Only these people who are pissing us off. Yeah. So we're, we're in their debt, right? Should be, thank you. Yeah. That's, okay, so that's, Shantideva is the master of the reframe. But Buddhaghosa had already started doing this reframe stuff. And Shantideva, just like a few centuries later, he made one further move. If you read, somebody was mentioning yesterday, reading uh, mind training, Lojong literature, which is a huge bunch of stuff that's translated into English now. Great collection of mind training literature. Mind training literature is just full of all these kinds of reframing, how you can think about kinds of obstacles and challenges, the difficulties that come up from other people as spiritual opportunities. And of course, this is um, Pema Chodron's main thing, too, probably. Um, okay, what about gratitude towards all these beings who, as our long-lost mothers? That seems, you know, I, I, I okay, I'll just say I always thought that that was a Mahayana thing because I always heard it in Mahayana Buddhism. But it's not. It's right in the Pali Canon. It's right in Buddha Gosa. It's like fully explained, you know, over these beginningless rebirths, you can take to mind the fact that each being you encounter, including the ones who are intending to, you know, attack you at that moment, are your long lost mothers. So, you know, so. Yeah, this is what I, what I do with my students at CMU. I say, you know, imagine your mother, you know, who's loved you and raised you and has cared for you, is suffering from, you know, a schizophrenia, has gone off her medication and has uh, tried to self-medicate by drinking a, a fifth of vodka. And then she comes home and sees you and she, what she sees is a demon and she's terrified and she breaks the bottle and tries to attack you with it, right? So, you know... Is this an enemy? Who's the enemy here, right? And it's like, okay, so whatever we think about rebirth, you, this is like an invaluable thought experiment. Like, this is how it is. People are overwhelmed by delusion and mental afflictions. And um, it doesn't help them to go, oh, yes, mom, please cut me to ribbons. That's not helping them. But on the other hand, I'm going to take you out. That is also not helping them because you identify them as the enemy to be destroyed. That's not the enemy to be destroyed. The enemy to be destroyed is the delusion and the anger, you know, that's uh, in our minds and theirs, yeah, and in particular at that moment in theirs, right? So how can we take care of ourselves it is tied up with how do I take care of my mother in that situation. It's, you know, I have to defend myself because otherwise she's getting a lot of you know, harm too by harming her own child, right? So, uh, yeah, it doesn't tell you what karate move to use. Do you see what I'm saying? But it gives you a way to think about the situation that, that is a starting point for, for figuring out how to, how to deal with it. And that's in, in Buddha Gosa and Shantideva, almost exactly the same. Okay, then there's reductive analysis. So the reductive analysis means that you, you look at the person who's like, you know, getting ready to hit you with the stick and you break that or has just finished hitting you with the stick and you break down the person that you have resentment or anger towards into component parts. And there's different ways you can do that and think, okay, am I mad at their finger, this finger, <laughs> am I mad at this finger, am I mad, which, which molecule of their body, am I mad at the water element, you know, am I mad at all the potassium in their body, am I mad at their synovial fluid, I mean, what, you know, which particular thing here, take, take the, the person that's like the target of your anger and say, well, what is that person, break it up into the component parts and sort of look for where your anger can really find purchase among the different parts of what's present. They both do exactly the same, almost exactly the same thing. Are you mad at their form aggregate, right, and so forth. Um, mad at their marrow. This is this is the sort of thing. And then also you can do it temporally, like break them down into, you know, moments and say, 
which microsecond is the per it, is the person that you are angry at existing in? <laughs> Because they don't, right? Like, wh where is this person actually findable in time? And so in that way, both of them suggest this kind of deconstructive analysis. Shantideva, in addition to that, says, look about, think about this. Is this person just, like, harmful by nature? Or they're not harmful, and they're not, like, a harm harmer by nature, but they just having a bad day or something like that, right? And he said, well, if it's just their nature to be harmful, right, then they can't help it, right? And so it's like, uh, you know, what, what would you, it's like a force of nature. It, they are a force of nature, right? If it's, and then, so what's the use of, of being angry at them? And I'm, so, that, yeah, that's what he said. It's like, uh, it's like being angry at fire for being hot. Right. If, if, if you hypothetically, if that's just their nature to harm you, if it's not their nature to harm you, which is probably more likely the case most of the time, right? It's just they're, they're just like cut in front of you in the line because they're having a bad day or something. Cut you off in traffic because they're having a bad day. It's like, well, it's being irrationally upset about something that's transient, like. Uh, I don't like all that smoke that's in the sky or something today. And it's like, well, that's just something that's a temporary condition that's passing through. It's not in the nature of the thing itself. Or, you know, they have other kinds of things like that. Like, um, so the stick that hit you was impelled by the person. And you're not angry at the stick. You're angry at the person who impelled the stick. But just like the stick was impelled to hit you by the person, the person was impelled by their anger in turn. So back it up one step. Why do you just like, you know, you're not angry at the stick, you backed it up to the person. So why not just back it up one step further and say, oh, I'm really like, my real problem is with anger itself, right? Um, yeah. Um, so there's a big, the gen generally, we find in Shantideva and Buddha Gosa, as I was saying, a big Dharma pharmacy of remedies where internal philosophical consistency is not a problem, but it's also not the main goal. Um, sometimes they might say things that seem contradictory with things they said in other place, but that's not the point. It's to give different people lots of options in terms of how they could deal with these problems that come up in our mind in real life. Um, the Dharma for them is not a matter of getting down to a single set of metaphysical truths. It's more a matter of using analysis to look at for all the different kinds of ways that they're different things that people can do to help each other or help themselves in different circumstances with the delusions and other afflictions that are affecting them. In other words, Shantideva and Buddha Gosa are both trying to be physicians, right, mainly, and philosophers second, <laughs> physicians first in the tradition of the Buddha himself, practical physicians. So a final example, and this is, I don't know, I guess that's one of my favorites because, it's, first of all, it's counterintuitive, and second of all, I think it actually happens to work for me. And I, yeah, is um, Buddha Gosa's last suggestion. Yeah, it's only number 19 or number 16, depending on how you count, right? It's like along some pages. It says, a lot of this is written with the assumption that there's a, it's all for a male monastic, right? <laughs> so he says, if the bhikkhu cannot affect the resolution, of the resentment, resented person by resolving them into the elements of the marrow and so forth, he should try giving a gift, either by himself to the other person or accepted by himself from the other. And in the one who does this, the annoyance with that person entirely subsides. Well, maybe it doesn't always in all cases. It's like there's something you can try, right? Just like the other 18 ideas. Um, so, yeah, how is that going to work? You know, it's like, 
if somebody's aggressive against you, how am I going to get that person to donate something to me so that I will be, that's not something that you can directly control. But you can give something to the other person. And um, so he gives an example. Let's get the impression that this might have been a real story. Uh, a monk, a junior monk, had been displaced three times from his quarters in the monastery by a senior monk, uh, the same senior monk. And so he has some resentment toward that senior monk that's causing, you know, he's obsessive, really, right? So he decides finally to give to this person whom he resents an alms bowl that he had received from his mother, and he gives it to that person. And uh, in that way, he was able to overcome his resentment. So it's like, really? Okay, so I was like, well, what's in the spirit of, um, you know, just trying it out, like next time the dean's office does something really bad to me or my department, I'll bake them some brownies, you know? <laughs> And I did, I've done that. I've done, I actually did it. I've done it. And it's like, yeah, that's, it's interesting. It kind of, it changed the whole vibe. First of all, like, you know, people are like kind of surprised because they surely have some sense that you're not very happy with them. And then they are kind of happy that you're seeming not to be so angry at them. And, and they're grateful that, you know, you're relieving the tension in the social relationship by giving. And then their positive feelings about your generosity actually affect your feelings towards them in turn. I don't know. That I'm not saying that this works all the time, right? That's the whole thing. None of these things work all the time for everybody. Yeah, You've just got a lot of different ways to try to work with these kinds of grudges and resentments that we have. We try to expand our love and care boundlessly. We're going to come against some sticking points. As I said, sometimes it's at the very beginning when we don't truly love and care for ourselves. right? That's important. That We have to start there. But beyond that, we come to certain people where it's like really hard to get past them and include them in the, in the sphere of our concern. And so that's, how, that's why I think both of these, these guys, you know, both the not Mahayana and non-Mahayana are really concerned with giving us a lot of different techniques um, for working with those situations. Okay. Thanks. I can take any questions for the next few minutes. Uh, hi. hi. For the um, last piece you said, it sounded a little bit like um, bribery or uh -huh. protection uh -huh. money. Uh -huh. I pay you so uh -huh. that I don't get harm from you anymore. Oh, yeah. yeah it could be interpreted that way, right? Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, well, um, I don't think that, 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 I don't think that was Budagos's intention, but, uh, um, I think he's really interested in like, he's seriously thinking about how do we clear our own hearts? Like, okay, so um, this example is in my mind. Um, I saw this uh, video about the American Indian movement and um, you know, how there were gun battles on um, the Lakota reservation in South Dakota between the American Indian Movement and um, the uh, enforcers who were associated with the tribal council who opposed this Native American militancy. And people actually like did drive-by shootings of each other's houses and shot each other's houses up and so forth. That was in the time, I don't know if you remember, like when the American Indian Movement marched, you know, drove to Washington, D.C. and occupied the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C. So when these people got home to the reservation, it wasn't that the you know, tribal uh, leaders were that happy with them, right? And then they had, quote, goons who were, you know, other Native Americans who were driving around, and they were all, they were shooting each other. And there's this guy who was part of the, the, the movement, and he said, 
he's saying well, years later he's getting the car driving with one of these former enemies out to go do a sweat lodge together and he said like they're asking him about like how is that and he said well you know it just doesn't do any good to hold hatred in your own heart you know it just it's just eats you up and right and that's it's like it's really he's not saying it's like it, it's not that it's out of concern for this guy. It's really he's trying to take care of himself and his anger and resentment toward the other person. He just said, uh, this is an unhealthy way to be, right? It's like for my own welfare, I have to find a, have a, have a way to, to care for this other person as a, as a brother, right? So that, I, I can understand how there could be a different... I think every, actually every one of these things can be susceptible to different kind of analyses. But I really think that that's the spirit in which Buddhaghosa is telling that story, giving, suggesting that story. Yeah, we could, we could adopt the technique with different intentions, though. <laughs> I guess that, that you elucidate that, yeah. Yeah. So, Professor Newland, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. And I was also really captivated by number 19 um, and was sort of thinking in ways. And it reminds me of the, the literature on cognitive dissonance. Yeah. That actually, it's very difficult to actually bake the brownies for somebody yeah. at the same time of holding, you know, <laughs> hatred toward them. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so I immediately thought of some, you know, all the people who slight at me that I might make them brownies or you send, them try check, it. send them flowers. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it's, it's, um, it's uh, yeah, it's counterintuitive. And um, it's not, it's just, I don't know. I don't think I... I, I, if may, it could be that's in Shanti Deva, and I've just never seen it. I got it from Buddha Gosa, and I never really heard of it before. Yeah. yeah it's, very, it's very consistent with the idea of cognitive dissonance. Yeah. You can't simultaneously try to something So the practice of, of making yourself doing something nice for them is like eating away at your tendency to hold negative feelings for them. I, I, I felt like that was true in my case when I, when I did it. Yeah. I started to think of these these people as human beings who would enjoy the brownies <laughs> instead of harmers. <laughs> Do you just want to think? Yeah, I, I, of course, that thought crosses one's mind, and one sets it aside. <laughs> yes, there's a question behind you, Eunice. Thank you very much for your yeah. talk. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, that also makes me think that, um, you know, I can be helping myself and changing my feelings by doing something nice for them who slighted me. Mm -hmm. I could also think of it, they might think of it as positive reinforcement. Yeah. <laughs> so, or they might take it, it as like, oh, this person can be walked all over. Right. Right. No, there's right. There's so lots of right. That. Yeah. So, yeah, the question is like, well, is there an appropriate way to be uh, assertive of what's necessary to be asserted? Do you know what I'm saying? I um <laughs> I I try to um be steadfast in representing what I think is fair and just at the same time not demonizing the people who have a different point of view within the institutions. Which sometimes is hard, right? Yeah, yeah. I've been struggling with this for a while. Um, in our administration, they're putting kids in camps and they're getting abused. Yeah. How do you have compassion for that kind of behavior? Well, I, I wouldn't have compassion for the behavior. We have to object to the behavior. Behavior is not the same as an other human being. Like, let's, let's, I mean, that's a good example, right? What is like Kristen Nielsen, right? She, she's actually, she's actually a human being, right? It's like, okay, so you can think about her as a human being who's like, okay, she now has the, the karma associated with all these decisions she made. She has, you know, people who are put, people who are, you know, put in charge of torturing other people or abusing other people suffer PTSD often, quite a lot, right? There, there's research on this that PTSD is not just for the survivors 
uh, on the victim side. It suffer, a lot of people suffer psychological damage because of what they themselves have done that they can't later live with. Right. I don't know that that would be the case with her, but we, we don't know, right? She's, she, she doesn't look like a, a happy person in any of the pictures I see, you know? And I, I don't think it's, it, we have to see that it's not incompatible to like object to thing, choices she's made, to feel deep concern for the people she's harmed, and to have deep concern for her as well, right? That, right, I, I know it's difficult, but I, I, I think we should have to, t she's a, it's a perfect example, all right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we're, we're supposed to stop now. Okay, well, <laughs> we're gonna do a dedication then. Okay. May all beings have happiness. May they be free from suffering. May they find the joy that has never known suffering. May they be free from attachment. 